Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as always, we will wait for a couple of minutes to reach a limited number of audience. Salam be hamigi, khili khosh amadi. Mesa hamishe kami forsat midim o zaman mimiladim ta mokhatao be min azafe besham va baad azon shuru mikani. Ya saman jan khubi. استاد بابایی سلام حال شما چطوره خوبین؟ یا سمان جان اگر نکته ای بود توی واتسپ برای من پیام بده استاد بابایی بنیان گذاره متود میوزن سلام به ما اضافه شدن استاد جان خوش آمدید آه آه هلو جنیفر آه تانکس فور جوینینگ آه از آی منشند بیفور Uh, we will call. Uh, we will wait for a couple of minutes, and after that, I will send you the request. Don't worry. Just uh, uh, save it us. Do not leave. <sighs> okay. Man, be hamem khatavan Farsi zaban salam arz mikonam, and I say hi to everybody uh, who joined us tonight. Thank you for being with us. All. Okay. یه مقدار زمان بدیم uh, Hi everybody uh, I think it's okay we can start uh, and after that I will ask Jennifer to join us Okay, uh, at the beginning I will speak a couple of words in Persian to introduce Jennifer uh, to the Persian audiences and after that uh, I will ask Jennifer to join us and we will carry on in English. Uh, so uh, stay with us. Uh, only maybe two or three minutes I will speak Persian and after that uh, I will again change my language for the English. خب سلام مجدد. من میگه فکر کنم شروع کنیم کم کم. امشب یه مخاطب یه مهمان خیلی ویژه داریم. جنیفر جانسن افتخار دادم و توی لایو ما حضور دارن. از در واقع مدرسه خیلی خیلی با سابقه بادی مپینگ که کتاب تمام چیزهایی که یک نوازنده ویولون برای نوازندگی باید بدون هم نوشتن راجع به بدنه اسم کتاب است What Every Violinist Should Know About The Body کتاب خیلی خیلی معروفیه تمام نوازنده زهی توی دنیا تقریبا این کتاب میشناسن جای مختلف دنیا هم تدریس میشه جنیفر حالا خودش به و اون کامل توضیح میده داستان زندگیشو حالا من دیگه چیزش نکنم لوسش نکنم ولی خودش آسیب دیده بوده و بعد از اون حالا تصمیم میگیره و که چیکارا بکنه و در نهایت به اینجا میرسه که مربی بادی مپینگ میشه توی نیوفلند کانادا هست و میگم جزء تیم اصلی بادی مپینگ خودش نوازنده ویولون و توی حالا ارکست نیوفلند هم ساز میزنه و جای مختلف هم دعوتش میکنن الان که خب کرونا بیشتر در واقع به ساعت آنلاین دعوتش میکنن ولی پیش از این به ساعت حضوری دعوتش میکنن برای اینکه کنفرانس به دراجه بادی مپینگ دو تا کتاب داره یکیش همین چیزایی که یک نوازنده ویولون راجع بدنش باید بدونه است و و یکیش تدریس بادی مپینگ به کودکانه حالا در راه نوشتن کتاب بعدیش هم هست فوق العاده با اطلاعات و یه لطف بزرگی که به ما داشت جنیفر کلا چیز شبکه اجتماعی نداره یعنی اینستاگرام داشت نه لینکدین داره نه فیس فکر کنم علاوه فیسبوک داره که فعال نیست آره تو فیسبوک هم در ارتباطیم ولی اصلا فعال نیست به خاطر اینکه تو لایو ما بیاد چیز اینستاگرام باز کرده خیلی لطف بزرگی من واقعا ازش نهایت تشکر دارم که انقدر به ما لطف داشتن امشب ما راجع به خودش میپرسیم که اصلا برگراندش چیه چیکاره کرده و بعد اینکه چه جوری آسیب دید و بعد چی شد که تصمیم گرفت بره سراغ بادی مپینگ و راجع به کتاباش ما توضیح میده و در انتهای یه سری تمرینا از بادی مپینگ بهمون میده که به من گفته با تجربه تایم بین دو تا یا سه تا تمرین خواهیم داشت ببینیم چه جوریه من دیگه بیشتر از این وقت رو نمیگیرم از جنیفر دعوت میکنم که به اون اضافه بشه من زبان رو به انگلیسی تغییر میدم جاهایی که نکته خیلی مهمیه خب مثل همیشه من از جنیفر یه کمی همیشه از در واقع 
مهمون ویژمون تایم میگیریم یکم من یه ترجمه به فارسی دارم سریع و سریع برمیگردیم فقط نکته که هست اینه که چون تایم خیلی زیاد نیست مجبورم یه کلیت موضوع بگم یعنی توقع چیز نباشه وقت نگید چرا ترجمه دقیق نیست و اینا چون من مجبورم که کلیت بگم حالا ممکنه با ترجب لایبا قبلی و اطلاعاتی که خودم مثلا قبلا با این دوستان صحبت کردم یه خورده یه سه چیزا بهش اضافه کنم که درک شاید تر بشه میخوام بگم که ترجمه لغت به لغت نیست فایدتا من کانسپت رو توضیح میدم و اگر مثالی از خودم باشه که ببینم کمک میکنه قطعا اضافه میکنم خب من دیگه کم کم دعوت میکنم از جنیفر پارت با اون باشید خیلی به نظر خودم لایو جالبی باید باشه اوکی هالو تو ایوریبادی کو جوین داس تونایت تانک یو سو مچ ایس مای ابسولوت پرشر تو هاست جنیفر جانسون ان اوثر musician and uh, teacher of body mapping technique uh, I'm sure that tonight uh, there's a lot to discuss and she has a lot to share with us uh, for me it's a lifetime opportunity to be with Jennifer and talk to her actually uh, I want to thank her at first because uh, she didn't have Instagram and she just opened another, uh, a page for being in our IG live which is Uh, which means a lot to me and uh, I don't want to waste it on more than that and I will send Jennifer the request and we will start okay Jennifer I'm sending you the request please accept it and join us you'll see something on your uh, 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 screen please uh, it's a request accept it and join us hello are you able to see me or hear me oh hello <laughs> hello Hamid how are you thank you how are you I'm doing very well thank you uh, Jennifer, I think there is a problem. Just wait a second. Man, you have to bear me cheesy beer. Okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Uh, I think there's a problem with the sound. Just wait a minute. Okay. Uh, I have your voice. Let me just see. Can yes, you hear can me you now? Me? I can hear you fine. But yeah. I think there is a problem. I cannot not... hear your voice. Okay. Hmm. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, I think, it's, uh, can I you think, hear me? I can hear you, and I'm seeing messages that they can hear me as well. Okay, okay. Uh, can I do something? Just can I remove you and send you the request again? Yes, absolutely. Oh, I was trying to remove you. چه اتفاقی افتاده من صده جنیفر رو نداشتم حالا یه بار دیگه من برش ریکوست بفرستم okay. uh, okay. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry, sorry for the delay. No worries. Is that any better?
Okay. I'm so sorry for the delay. I okay. have your voice now. How about you? Do you have mm -hmm. mine? Yes, I can hear you beautifully. Okay. Okay. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate what you did for us. You opened an Instagram page for being in our live. And it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for introducing <laughs> me to a new platform because it's, uh, oh, yeah. is still new to me in many ways. And I'm really happy that we have it working. So pleased to be here. Okay. How, how did you find it? Uh, is it good or not? Instagram, you mean specifically? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's great to have something that is, you know, specifically made for a phone. I'm used to, I've, it took me about a month to get really confident on Zoom <laughs> back in April. Oh. And uh, okay. I feel very confident there, but uh, so it's great to have this other option now. Yes, yes. And Instagram is really good for uh, finding new friends. Uh, that's a really good a platform uh, that helps you to find uh, your friends and uh be connected with them again. Yeah. Yes. Ah, yes, it's perfect. Okay, Jennifer, I don't want to waste the time. Uh, just tell me about yourself, your educational background, and your university degree, your principal instrument. Let us know more about that. Sure. Um, I grew up in, I'm, I live now in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, as you said, but I I'm, I'm, uh, grew up in southern Ontario in kind of the middle part of Canada and uh, in a really small village where there was no music education, except for my mother, who was a Suzuki piano teacher. And she, bless her heart, oh. was a very dedicated mother. And she um, was determined that we would have access to stringed instruments. And so she drove us, oh, for over 10 years, she drove my sister and myself over an hour every week, sometimes twice a week, in order to uh, get to a violin and a cello teacher. My, my sister was playing cello at the time. So we started there in a Suzuki program in a, a town called London, Ontario. And um, that's where I got my start. And then I started uh, my first music degree in violin performance at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, which is in a city called Kitchener-Waterloo in Ontario still. Yes. And because I had some injuries along the way, I ended up taking a year off to try to fix them. And I spent a year in, in Vancouver studying with a wonderful teacher. And then I went and finished my degree in the States uh, in South Carolina um, with another wonderful teacher. And they taught me lots, but unfortunately that was before the days of musicians having any information about how to overcome injuries. So I was still struggling with that at the end of my degree. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh, I see. Okay, how old were you when you started uh, to play the violin? Uh, I think I was six. I was four when I started piano, and then I was six when I started on violin. Ah, uh, good. And uh, uh, who, uh, I mean, uh, of course, your first teacher was your mother. She was teaching you the piano, but who was your first uh, violin teacher? Uh, was she a, a, an expert in, was she or he, I don't know which one was that, uh, an expert in Suzuki as well or not? They were all just kind of starting um, to learn about Suzuki themselves. I mean, I'm, I'm much older than you are. So this was back in the early 70s. And Suzuki oh. had, had kind of come to North America, you know, I think mid 60s. So they, they really only had it for a few years. Some of them were more experienced than others, and, um, but they were all learning. And uh, it was a man. I started with a man named Alan Broughton. And then my next teacher, about four years later, I switched to a wonderful teacher named Richard Lawrence. And I think I still owe him. I think, you know, having stuck through the injuries for two decades before I found answers, I really owe that to that second teacher who instilled in all of his students this um, amazing love of music. And uh, he was just such an inspiration to us uh, that it, it wasn't something that I was easily going to let go, even though I, my body was hurting. Ah, good. And uh, how long did you uh, play the music until you have, heard that in, uh, you have uh, faced that injury? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I 
probably Hamid, I would say from the very first lesson, I was set up to be injured because I, I remember being oh. that age and being very nervous of this first teacher and just not because of anything about him, but I was a shy personality. I was six. We'd just driven an hour. I was, had just woken up from a snooze in the car. Big city, which I wasn't used to. And so there was a lot of intimidation, I think, around my approach to the instrument. So I would say that the stage was set really early for injuries starting mm -hmm. to happen, um, just because of my emotional state. But then, you know, I was 12 and I was in a lot of pain already by the time I was 12 years old. And uh, wow. yeah, it was, it was pretty early. And I remember just being in agony, you know, rubbing my shoulders and saying to my mom, you know, just what can you do? How, you know, and it wasn't even just with violin playing, but it was certainly, it got worse after I had been practicing. Um, so oh. we, you know, the next few years, we, tr she tried her best to find answers. We were to chiropractors and acupuncturists and massage therapists and, um, you know, it would help for a few days and then I would start doing the same movements and of course it was back again. <laughs> yes, it's the problem with musician because uh, we have repetitive motions. Even if uh, we are cured and healed, we are like an ordinary person, we will face the injury just maybe a week or two weeks after that and uh, we have to change something and we have to find ways to uh, uh, let's say get rid of our bad habits uh, our bad habits are the problems and um, I wanted to ask you which part of your body were mostly infected yeah it, it began uh, at that age in my early teens it began in the, the trapezius muscles and the neck and then a couple years later it kind of worked its way down into the shoulder region a lot of pain you know, sharp pain here and kind of dull aching pain there. And I look back at photographs of myself now at that age and I think, well, of course, <laughs> you know, you see the, <laughs> the head extended yeah. forward and that poor little, I was tiny. I'm still not very big, but I was tiny then and I was playing this huge violin and reaching for it with wow. the head. And people just, I'm sure the teachers knew then that it didn't look great, but they, I, there was no awareness about the fact that that could lead to lifelong, you know, injury or, you know, people weren't thinking 10 years down the road then about what could happen to the body. Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned a really good thing uh, that uh, despite our body, our body size, our, uh, let's say, gender, our age, we all play with the same instrument and we call it the standard size of the instrument, which is, uh, in my estimation, not true. Uh, it's awful, you know. Uh, for example, uh, if we just compare my body with yours, we have nothing in common, you know. Even if uh, I compare my body with my brother, we also have nothing in common. But uh, we play the same instrument and we believe this is a, a standard size and we have to just uh, compromise our posture, our body and our health for playing it. Uh, that's why I just ordered a, a guitar that is my size, you know. <laughs> Uh, that is a specific individual uh, because we really need these days. Uh, okay, did you uh, attend, uh, I mean, music schools, colleges, universities? How the in uh, actual journey continued? After, after the, I was at the, um, doing my degree. Well, I took a couple years off to see if, I, once again, if I could figure it out. Uh, I didn't, I don't mean off, I was playing, but um, I went and took a teaching position in Alberta, Canada, and in Lethbridge, and I taught there at the conservatory for two years, um, and had lessons with people, but it still wasn't improving, and I hadn't had any revelations about how I was going to get out of this yet, and uh, then I got uh, a phone call one day asking me if I'd like to come and play in a professional string quartet in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I, of course, that's many many of us who are upper string players or string players at all, that's a dream to be able to make your living in a string quartet and play that incredible repertoire. So injury or no, I jumped at the chance and, you know, jumped both <laughs> in and, um, <laughs> you know, I got by just because I was so excited about the job and I, you know, was doing lots of stretching and, you know, what I could do. But about, I think it was my second year 
so I played with that quartet for 12 years, and this was in 1993. So I think before 1994 was up was when uh, I woke up one morning and I couldn't raise my right arm. I mean, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't move away from my body. I couldn't move it. It was very scary. And what, you know, so this was a, a way more of a problem than just pain and injury. It just suddenly I couldn't move it. So long, very long story short, it took them a long time to figure out what was going on. But um, the serratus anterior muscle had atrophied underneath the shoulder blade. And uh, with about eight months of good physio, I was back playing again. But if we fast forward another, gee, I kind of just wobbled by for another seven years, almost maybe six years. And then I met my first Alexander Technique teacher. And that's when everything really started to change. And he, his name is Trevor Allen Davies. He's a wonderful, wonderful actor, Shakespearean actor, and, but also a terrific uh, Alexander Technique teacher. And he was coming to visit in St. John's Newfoundland three or four times a year. So for, for uh -huh. two, three, four years, I had lessons with him. And I remember just one day lying on the floor after we'd done some floor work and thinking, oh, if I could just feel like this with the violin in my hands, uh, I could get on with it, you know? And yeah. then, uh, so the, that's when I kind of, the light bulb went off and I thought, I've got to just take some time off from the quartet and just go and see what I can find out from you know, some of, I really wanted to study with Alexander teachers who were musicians, specialized with musicians. So that took me another year of getting the funding together and Canada Council for the Arts was wonderful. They gave me $20,000 grant, which at that point basically covered everything for seven months. And, um, and off I went, I went to England. And then uh, I studied with Pedro, who I know has been a guest on your program before. Uh, I went, spent six yes. weeks him having regular lessons almost daily with him. I owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude for what he taught me. And John Crawford was the violinist in London, England, who I worked with most, and I also owe him a great deal. Um, so that was, I wasn't training to become a teacher, although I was thinking about it, but I just was fascinated by how it could make people feel better and I wanted to understand it better. And uh, I learned a great deal on that seven month sabbatical. Oh, oh, that's that was a really nice story. Thanks for sharing it with us. Uh, would you please give me a couple of minutes to translate uh, this part into Persian? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, oh, man, I get to see a sari as to Adam, but I'm not Roger Baker on the Jennifer Porcidam, Jennifer as Sene Kuchik Hope Go Fick come as she saw the year. اگه شما نکنم یه چهار سالگی حالا چک کنید پیانو شروع میکنه مامانش مدرس سوزوکی بوده توی ساز پیانو پیانو شروع میکنه میزنه و بعد میره سراغ ویولون میگه از همون دفعات اول من درد رو داشتم یعنی از اولی که سازو گرفتم دستم درد داشتم خب یه دلیلش هم به خاطر این بود که از شخصیتی میشه گفت که خجالتی بوده و افرادی خجالتی هم خب وقتی ساز میزن بیشتر خوشون جمع میکنن قاعدا دفعه شورده شده بوده بعدا و انقباز داشتن دوازده سالگی دیگه درداشون شروع میشه و حالا همینجوری میاد جلو و دعوت میکنن میرن توی یک کوارتتی از توی نیفنلند خیلی کوارتتی معروفیه میرن اونجا و چیز میکنن که در واقع تو اون کوارتت میزنن و بعد همینجوری مثل روال زندگیشون ادامه پیدا میکنه تا اینکه یه بار میگن که دیگه دست راست هم تکون نمیخورد مایچه زیر شولدر بلید یعنی مایچه پشت کتفشون اصلا میگه فروزن شده بود دیگه دست, دست راستشون بالا نمیمده بعد دیگه شروع میکنن حالا چیزهای مختلف رو امتحان کردن الکساندر رو امتحان میکنن میگه سه چهار سال با این نفر توی کانادا چیز داشتن بعد میره انگلیس یه بکنم شیش هفته اینا شاگرد پیدرو بوده پیدرو دیال کانترا هم که ما دعوتش کرده بودیم به فوق العاده آدم نازنین و با اطلاعاتی بود. پیش اون بوده و پیش نوازنده ویالون که در واقع این پاسچرش و اینا رو درست میکرده تا اینجا استوری در واقع داستان من خیلی خلاصه گفتم به وقت سای پاسچرش رو از که همچون دیگه خیلی خسته کننده میشد من برم سراغ جنیفر ببینیم که چجوری بوده اوکی جنیفر what happened that you became interested in body mapping how, how were you introduced to body mapping It was while I was studying with uh, John Crawford, the violinist in London, 
who was the Alexander teacher, who he just said to me, just kind of out of the blue, he said, you really need to meet Barbara Conable. And strangely enough, I thought I had read at that point every book on Alexander. I hadn't come across her book yet. And um, so he actually sent me home that day with a copy of it. I have it here, it's How to Learn the Alexander Technique. That was her first book really about body mapping. And uh, so I devoured it. I just covered a cover. I just thought, this is amazing. This explains so much of what I needed to know, what I've been looking for for decades to try to feel better. And so I think like that very week, I, you know, it was in the early, earlier days of the internet, but I was online and I tried to find where she'd be teaching. And I found she was doing a week long um, uh, kind of version of her course called What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body uh, in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And I thought it, the timing was perfect. It, I changed my flight. I, I flew there instead of flying straight home. And it was right at the end of my seven month sabbatical that I met Barbara and spent that week with her. And at the end of that week, I remember walking up to her and thanking her and saying, this is what I have been looking for my whole life. And it wasn't much longer after that, that I emailed her and said, I, you know, I'd really want to train with you in this. So that was in 2004. And um, I guess at the, it would have been, yeah, I took about a year. I, I went back to the quartet and I was playing, but I was studying all of the training manuals that she gave me. And I, about a year later, uh, I, I usually these days it takes people, I don't know, three, four years sometimes. But um, I had a whole summer where I did nothing but just, you know, study her information. And um, so in 2005, I licensed, I flew her out here and she watched me give the full course. Uh, which is kind of the final exam. And um, then she licensed me. So that's, wow. yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. then I was lucky to have five more years of kind of unofficial training with her. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got all these books stacked here. When I was writing that book, that was my first book, What Every Violinist Needs to Know. Uh -huh. uh, it, she, she edited every word of that for me. So she went through, you know, every chapter I'd send her, she went through it with a fine tooth comb and helped me, you know, edit and figure out if it, making sure it was accurate enough. Um, so that I was really lucky. That was some extra time I got to train with her. Yes, yes. Uh, is she still alive? Yes, yes. She's alive and well. We're happy to oh. say that. Yeah. She's, she retired. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Yeah, we're very lucky to still have her as a mentor. But she, she retired and, and handed the organization on... She, when she stepped down as president, she handed it to our friend and colleague, Amy Lycar, and, and Amy was president for several years. So, and then, and then it just really grew, you know, it kind of blossomed, uh, you know, in the last, I don't know, five, six years, the, the organization has just really gotten much, much bigger and uh, have a lot of excited people about this work now. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, you mentioned Amy. Uh, I just want to say hi to Amy and uh, Pedro as well. Uh, uh, and uh, if there was a possibility, I will uh, uh, actually <laughs> host Amy as well <laughs> because I think she has also a lot to share with us. Yes. Uh, you uh, mentioned that. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a question. I forgot it. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you, uh, the time that you were studying body mapping, uh, were you still playing or you stopped uh, your uh, performance for a while? Well, I didn't do a lot of playing during my seven month sabbatical. It really was, you know, I would just pick the violin up to try new things, but it didn't, um, wasn't doing much then. Once I got back to St. John's that summer, I also wasn't doing a lot of playing. So I had about three months there where I was just really devouring the information and trying to change my movement patterns away from the instrument. Now that is not the way we generally train we generally get people on their instrument right away but I didn't hadn't really clued into that yet I was just and it, it may I might have been different I was a, a very extreme case of somebody who was what we call mismapped you know in every single part of my body that you know there had I was only in my mid-20s but I was already having pain when I walked in one foot because of how I was compensating through the rest of the body for you know what was going on up here so there was a lot of um, peeling back of the layers that I needed to do uh, but what I loved most about it was that, you know, because we did not have an Alexander teacher living here in St. John's where I live, 
uh, Barbara's wonderful work, everything that she wrote down, gave me a, a measure of independence to absorb everything that I had just learned from all these wonderful Alexander Technique teachers. But I could translate it in ways that I could really make up my own movement explorations even. You know, once I understood how two bones were meant to meet each other, um, I could say, oh, oh, well, that's why it felt so bad for two decades, you know, because that's not how I thought my bones were moving with each other. And then I'd remember something an Alexander teacher had said. And I said, well, that's what they meant. And that's what their hands gave me that day that I felt so good. And I had that release. So it was just kind of uh, another way to put the, the pieces of the puzzle together. And it works beautifully hand in hand with other somatic methods like Alexander or Feldenkrais, you know, we, when yeah. we are training people now, we, we always make sure that they are also having some other somatic uh, lessons wow. in another field, just because it marries together what, you know, what we're all after is just freedom and ease of movement at our instruments. So, um, yes. yeah, it helps enhance that. Yes, uh, yes, you mentioned a really good uh, thing, and uh, I think uh, it's good if I just talk about it. Uh, what we are doing is exactly what you mentioned uh, because we are saying that we have to gather all these, uh, let's say, methods, approaches together and uh, because they actually help each other to be perfect, you know. Uh, we cannot say, for example, uh, only this one can, uh, you know, change everything. Of course, we need different things and we have to just put them together together uh, to get the result that we want because uh, you know, we are individually different. And maybe, maybe, for example, if I work on this method, it would uh, you know, be better for me if I work on the other one. It's uh, sometimes uh, about our body as well, our mind as well, because we have um, diff uh, different mental and physical condition, which uh, is really important we, and we have to respect that. Uh, you mentioned uh, and you talked about the Alexander technique. Uh, have you ever had any, uh, let's say, uh, teacher training course in Alexander technique? And is it necessary for a body mapping teacher to take a uh, teacher training course in Alexander? Or no, they are two separate things. <clears throat> they are separate now. I mean, I think Barbara's original idea you know, she, she, when, when she and her, at the time she was married to a cellist named Bill Conable, and um, he was the one who first, the penny kind of dropped for him first. He noticed that uh, this violinist that he was coaching was playing with a very stiff bow arm, and he asked her where she thought her elbow was, and she pointed somewhere else, not where the two bones were meeting to provide that bending movement at the elbow, and... So she, you know, he, he corrected it for, he showed her exactly where that joint is and how the two bones fit. And, you know, he probably showed her a model, something like the one I have here, you know, showing where that bending happens. And uh, uh -huh. she's, you know, proceeded to then play with the freer bow arm because she said, felt like, oh yeah, well, that's pretty easy. I can do that. So that, that's just an example of a really, um, the very first remapping, I guess, officially that ever happened. And so he went home and they talked about it. And, you know, I, 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 my understanding is that they thought, well, this could help our Alexander technicians learn a lot faster if we can make sure that they get past the misconceptions that they're carrying around about their own body. You know, if we can just eliminate these funny, weird things that come because maybe we were told to sit up straight when we were little, or, you know, we, we were told to get our shoulders back, all of that stuff that our culture has taught us from a very young age um, that can lead to these misconceptions and these mismappings as we refer to them um, where the neurons are actually changing in that part of the brain that represents that part of the body and our whole job is to change those neurons back again so that the movement the new habit is is uh, can can be done unconsciously you know that we've we've actually um, just changed it back to how it began when we were very very little so this is a long-winded way of answering your question, but um, it did start as an idea that this could help Alexander Technique um, students. And then they realized that, you know, if we just apply this with musicians, you know, she worked a lot with musicians and dancers. They started just seeing how effective it could be if people could just get rid of their misconceptions, whether they had had much Feldenkrais or much Alexander. So it has taken on a life of its own. 
but we never ever just say that you know we we want we definitely want people to be experiencing other somatic methods along with it mm -hmm. that's really good and uh, uh just tell us about body mapping and what body mapping is i think sure. uh, it's worth mentioning that what uh, aspects does it cover and uh, how do you teach your students uh, what is the first step and how do you continue? Let us know about body mapping and your sessions. Okay. Well, um, I just gave you a few, a very, very brief synopsis of what the body map actually is. And, and that is a word that neuroscience uses too. That's not something that um, Barbara, well, Barbara and Bill did kind of come up with it, but then found out that, that neuroscience was using it to describe that internal representation on the cortex of the brain. Um, but the technique of body mapping, really at the root of it is we, just, we want people to understand how bones are meeting one another in the body and what their design is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and how when we're not moving according to that design, uh, you know, what kind of injuries arise because of that poor movement at those particular joints. So we, you know, when we teach the full six hour course, um, the, like the first hour is about retraining our senses and our awareness in addition to retraining movement, because that's an important, really, you know, you, you cannot retrain your movement unless you have your kinesthetic sense working. And unless you've, you're, if you're really focused and concentrated all the time like this, your muscles are going to be also shortening. So helping people to open their awareness, especially in regards to performance anxiety. And then the second hour of the full course is about finding places of balance in the body when we're just at neutral, when we're just sitting there, you know, that this, where I spent 20 years with that, that head pulled forward and, you know, rotated back is not a place of neutral and it requires a lot of unnecessary muscle work. And then the third hour is about all of the arm joints and going into detail about how, um, the common mismappings that, you know, can lead us to tendonitis or lead us to bursitis or cause all of that holding up in the, in the shoulder region. Uh, the fourth hour is all about breathing. The fifth hour is all about legs, um, specifically in movement, specifically playing our instruments, how we can make our whole bodies integrated right from the feet to the top of our head in our music making so that we're not just thinking about playing the violin with our forearms. Um, and um, and then finally, when we teach the, the full course, the sixth hour is a masterclass format where we we show the audience, the participants, you know, with one or two people come up and play for, you know, a few minutes and we work with them and show them um, how to apply all of this information that they just learned in the first five hours. And oh. you asked how, how we do that with a student. And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, what Barbara was brilliant at was using the Socratic method of question asking. So to say, oh. you know, what is it you're feeling? Where are you feeling it? Are you aware of, you know, the, your big toe on your left foot? You know, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, just really, if you notice that somebody is stiff in a place, then, you know, you can just say, you know, tell me about that. How does that feel? Where are the joints that move you there? And that's how we start to uncover where their misconceptions, their mismappings are. And then the second step is, you know, bringing out a guy like this fellow beside me or, you know, the pictures you see behind me on the wall. We compare the truth in these anatomical models and images with, um, you know, what the person had answered originally. And they go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I thought that, you know, my finger bent here instead of here. And and that's how we that's how we start to change the map back again. And then we come up with a lot of movement explorations to help them take that into movement, both with the instrument and away from the instrument. So in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's how we teach it. Um, some people take the full six hour course. Some people, you know, just call up and want to have private lessons. Um, and interestingly, after, since last April, what many of us have found out is that it works really, really well on this kind of format online. Uh, because, you know, we don't do very much hands-on guidance. I do still, if, if, uh -huh. if I'm teaching a violin lesson, because I always have as a violin teacher, I have always guided a bow arm physically if, if they're comfortable with it. But 
um, you know, most of us in, in body mapping, we, we can do this by showing people the truth and then asking them questions and, and helping them just figure out uh, how they need to move differently by watching them. So it's kind of exciting that yeah. we can reach people all over the world with it. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, your clar clar uh, clarification. Uh, as I understood, uh, the course is about six hours uh, at the beginning. Am I right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, and is it the same for all the instrument players? For example, if I uh, join, I'm a guitarist and my wife is a cellist. Uh, is it the, exactly the same for both of us? It depends on who's te uh, teaching it. I mean, if um, each of us puts our own spin on it for our own instrument. So when Barbara was first training me and she, and she came and watched my trial course, she wanted me to only teach violinists on that trial course. But she said, you know, mm -hmm. give it a few months and then you're going to be able to start taking this information and branching out and applying it to pianists, applying it to guitarists, because the information is about the body and, and about how the bones come together and are designed to move. So that is t completely applicable across the board to every single instrument out there and singers, you know, including singers. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we have we now have people who are trained in every single instrument. So if you're a clarinetist who is injured, it's really terrific if you can go and watch what every clarinetist needs to know about the body, uh, you know, and actually see a course that is designed with a lot of emphasis on what clarinetists suffer. And um, so, you know, we, we, we're, we send our students to one another to have lessons with other teachers who are of that instrument, even if they happen to live in our town and they, they started with us. Uh, so we, we're, it's a wonderful team of people who, you know, kind of cross over and work together uh, to make sure that everybody's needs are being met. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, the first session, I mean, uh, that six hours session happens in, this, uh, in one day or in six days? Uh, for example, you give them some instructions and you ask them, okay, go and do some study on that and come back tomorrow for the next session, or is uh, in, uh, in an entire day? The answer is both. We, we, do, we do it both ways. She designed it so that it could be taught in a day. You know, if that's what a school, if that's the amount of time that a music school has, let's do it in a day and make sure that information is out there. It's a lot in a day. But, you know, we have people take notes and make sure that they're absorbing as much as they can in the moment. Um, what's more fun, really, because you get to see the longer term results of your work, is when you get to teach it over several weeks or sometimes over several months if you're in a semester at a university. And I've done it always. Oh. And, and it's, all of them are gratifying because people will have revelations. The one day course, we always make sure people know that it really is just an introduction and that we encourage them to go find the books and keep reading and keep asking themselves questions. And, you know, I've read Barbara's first book probably eight or nine times from cover to cover, and I still learn new things that I missed the first time. So it's, it's a cyclical kind of learning. And we just really want people to, you know, to continue remaining independent with the information and just keep digging Yes, uh, uh, I have another question. Uh, these somatic approaches usually take a lot, a lot of time because we are just changing some habits and we are rebuilding our body, actually. Uh, after that six hours, uh, how do they get the lesson? For example, it's once a week or let's say once a month, two hours a week. How uh, does the sessions continue? It can be completely designed for their lifestyle. Some people come and they just want to voraciously eat it up and they have, you know, two lessons a week for a year. And other people have, you know, it's more common. You see people having a weekly lesson. But, you know, I've got some students who can't afford to have regular lessons. Maybe they, they have two a month or one a month. Or maybe they have a series of five and then they let three months go because they get busy at school. So it's entirely up to them and there's no time limit on it. We've really worked hard in the last few years, um, Amy will attest to this, uh, on revising all of the training manuals. And um, so, you know, once a trainee receives those training manuals, they can, they can decide to spend 
you know, five months if they want, just learning about the places of balance. And that's fine. It, it has to be paced according to their lifestyle. I see. I see. Thank you for the description. It was a nice. I was just visualizing how the session goes and uh, they are really good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I have a question from you uh, about uh, your principal instrument. You are, you are a violinist, and of course, you work with different violinists uh, uh, who want to learn body mapping. Uh, which part of their body you usually find most injured? For example, uh, you have 10 violinists, they come to you, and maybe you can say men, uh, most of them have problem in right shoulder, left shoulder, wrist, or I don't know. Which part you, uh, you find most problematic? Yeah. Well, I mean, there definitely are patterns. And, and I know you know that because that's why you're asking the question. There's patterns with every instrument. Um, and I mean, some violinists come with, you know, a really sore foot because they tripped when they were hiking last summer. You know, like there's always going to be those other things. But as a rule, uh, I mean, both, both shoulder regions, upper arm structure gets because of what's in our pedagogy about keeping the shoulders down. Uh, they, there's a mm -hmm. lot of strain there. And I would say particularly the left side, the, the number of questions that, you know, we have upper string players asking about just how to hold the darn instrument without fatiguing or hurting uh, is kind of the number one thing. Because, you know, a really common thing is that the, the violin rests on the collarbone. Uh, and if the head isn't balanced already, then they're already coming to try to meet the instrument with their head swinging from, you know, way down here in the neck vertebra, which means that the head is off balance, which means that the superficial neck muscles are having to grip more than they should. And then people get numbness in the left hand sometimes because the weight of the, the heavy head on the violin, on the collarbone, is starting to impinge some of the nerves that run underneath the collarbone and down into the hand. So left side is often the burning question when a violinist first walks into the course or into the room. Uh, that's more often than, this, than over here. But I mean, I was, I was both, but this, it was actually my right arm. Uh, I had been playing, when I first got injured that, right, that week then I couldn't lift my arm. I'd been playing principal second in the symphony orchestra, playing opera. So second, playing second violin in Puccini opera means that you're at the, this part of the, the bow on the g-string most of the time so you're in this ex very extreme place but i the more i hurt the more i thought i was supposed to push my shoulder down so i was really straining i was pulling pulling down here but trying to raise the rest of the arm up and uh, that's what mm -hmm. led to that final injury so shoulders and neck i would say in in general yes uh and how do you help them to overcome that injury? Because uh, they have to hold the instrument in this position. And uh, the posture is something like this. And uh, when uh, we first, uh, we first uh, visit a, let's say, instructor and we have, a, we have our first lesson, they usually tell us, OK, you have to hold the instrument. And we are uh, under a lot of pressure and we are stressed. And we try to uh, hold the shoulder by just, uh, hold the instrument by just raising our shoulder. and you know, put a lot of tension here. How do you help them to just uh, get rid of this uh, wrong posture that they usually have for holding their instrument? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked that question <laughs> because I, the, the first uh, exploration that I wanted to share with you has to do with this very issue. Um, and there are lots of other musicians besides upper string players who do suffer from this problem. I've met lots of singers who've been told to get the shoulders down uh, choristers, you know, often, uh, especially amateur singers, often in a, in a choir might take a deep breath and haul up in the arm structure. And then the choral director sees that and they don't know how to deal with it anatomically. And so they say, you know, just get those shoulders down or let the shoulders relax down even. And even that sometimes gets people pulling them down with muscle. So uh, uh, sorry I to interrupt you. Don't yeah. worry, it's not just a problem in my musician. Even my mother does that, <laughs> you know, when she's just washing the dishes or she's just chopping something. She's, right. just, she's always like this. And I, uh, I'm uh, reminding her, okay, okay, just let the shoulders go off. And he said, she says, yes, yes, you are right. And she does something like this. I think uh, it's for all people, not only for musicians. Sorry right. to interrupt you. 
No, that's okay. It's really important because we don't want to be up here and we also don't want to be so far down that we're actually pulling down on those bones. That's when we start getting numb in the hand. So finding the right language to help people find what Barbara called neutral for the arm structure. Uh, you know, a, a nice buoyant, light, uh, suspended arm structure is what we're looking for. Now, I, I need to back up a step because what I haven't said yet is that usually what the very first mismapping that causes people to be out of neutral is not understanding where their whole arm starts. So um, I'm just going to slide over to my Skelly guy here for a second and just show you that a whole arm, when I, when I wiggle this guy's arm here, you'll notice what else is moving up here is a collarbone and a shoulder blade. And in body yeah. mapping, we call that part of the arm. We say that that is where the arm starts, is right there. And it's a soft bone here, yes? Exactly, yeah. I'm in a, there's a probably easier way to see it on me. So that when, yes. um, I often bring this lady out because she's to blame in my mind for so much of our problems, that when Barbie goes swimming, uh, of course, <laughs> she can do her front curl stroke is that. And <laughs> when we go swimming, you know, we, we all giggle because it's so ridiculous. We know that's not how we move. And yet many of yeah. us, if we, if, you know, if I'd asked most of us to point to the top of the arm, many people would have pointed here rather than thinking about how it connects into the rest of the, the upper arm structure. This was my first injury. And I'll tell you now that um, what I believed was that there was a ball and socket joint and that was the top of the arm. And so I had what Barbara calls a fantasy socket in my map. I thought that that arm bone there, which is this one, came in and met a big cup. And I didn't think it had anything to do with the shoulder blade. I thought that there was a cup at the side of the body and that my shoulder blade lived on my back, completely separate. And when Barbara in that very first course showed me that the socket is the shoulder blade, that it lives, resides right there in the side of the shoulder blade, and that that, that shoulder blade has got to move in order to stay in contact with the ball, I just burst into tears. I mean, it had been 25 years of pain uh, and I hadn't understood that that's what was causing it because some muscles were yanking the shoulder blade away from the ball. And the ball was trying to lift a violin and a bow up and forward while other muscles were trying to pull back and down because I was trying to hold my shoulder blades back, back to sit up with good wow. posture, you know? So the, it was a huge emotional moment for me to realize that, uh, you know, if I wanted to be free, that I was going to have to retrain myself to consider this whole unit as part of my arm. And um, in fact, everybody can just try this at home. If you want to put your fingers on your collarbone. And uh, the first thing I want to drive home is that you can't move a shoulder blade without moving the collarbone. So if you put your fingers there, and try to wiggle your shoulder blade without letting the collarbone move, you'll notice that, hopefully, everybody will notice that that's impossible. That the movement <laughs> for a shoulder blade is coming from that arm joint right there. And, um, and then yes. the next thing that you can try is keeping your fingers on the collarbone and try to do a front crawl stroke like Barbie. In other words, don't let your collarbone move at all. Don't do this if you're injured already, by the way, if you've got pain here. But you'll notice that you're, if you try it, that you're very, very restricted. It, you can't do a front crawl without letting that move. So go ahead and, and, you know, do a front crawl stroke. And you will feel how much that collarbone and shoulder blade has got to move. As a yes. Open just take the Yeah, if you reach back, you blade. Feel the shoulder blade too. Exactly, yeah. Yes. And so that's... Yes. That Getting so popular. Story. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that funny? And it's, it's um, there's, there's a whole other, I mean, we also don't want musicians leading movement from this region. Sometimes when we teach this, people will immediately go, oh, you mean this? And I said, no, we're not talking about leading. Sometimes I talk about a train and a caboose where the caboose should not be pushing the train, which the caboose is like the, the collarbone and shoulder blade. And the train is like this part of the arm, the humerus. So we want the train, this bone here, to do the leading. And we want the caboose to come with it and follow it. We also don't want the caboose pulling in the opposite direction 
which is what caused my original injury. So oh. that, that's a really very, very common mismapping um, for many musicians and particularly upper string players. And we just really need to train that in. We need to, to get people feeling the sequence that this bone is going to start moving and that this whole region is allowed to move. It's just that it, we're not going to hunch and lead the movement from there. That's what musicians for centuries have been trying to get their students not to do. But they also don't want them pinned down onto their, onto their body because that's going to lead to even more serious injury like problems in the hands because of nerves being impinged. Yes, I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you for the demonstration. It was really nice, especially the, the skeleton and the examples. They were perfect. Uh, they help us to understand it better and they really uh, demonstrate the problem and the misconception and misunderstanding that we usually have. For example, uh, I remember when uh, I was in school, they used to tell us, okay, the the arm starts from here and that's why we all think that okay the arm is here and we never think that the arm starts here and when we move our arm it's moving up to here and yeah. uh, when we are holding the violin like this and we are trying to move our finger they are all connected and uh, actually they make it difficult for even uh, moving our finger and uh, we never think about that unfortunately uh, I just want to uh, ask you some question about your books, but because we are reaching the limited uh, time, I mean one hour, uh, I prefer to uh, stop this live and save it and start another one because I don't want to interrupt you be, uh, in the middle of the story. Uh, oh, just let me finish this one, save it, and start the live again for talking about your books and going through practical exercises. Is it okay with you? That's wonderful. Yes, thank you. Thank you. See you in a couple of minutes. Sounds good. Thank you. See. خب من این لایو رو قطع می‌کنم چون داریم از یک ساعت می‌شیم. چون می‌خواستم از جنیفر راجع به کتاب‌هاش بپرسم و یه سری تمرین بهمون بده، نمی‌خواستم وسط مطلب قطع بشیم. این لایو رو قطع می‌کنم. سیوش می‌کنم، لایو بعدی رو آغاز می‌کنم. جنیفر راجع به کتاب‌هاش بهمون توضیح میده و میریم سراغ تمرینات عملی. تا دو سه دقیقه دیگه دوباره شروع می‌کنیم. بهمون اضافه شید حتما. پارت دوم خیلی بالا میخوام تامینات عملی داشته باشیم این اسکلت هم با همون هست تو کل ماجرا میبینم میتونم 